Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live, the weekly online show live from the Nebraska Library Commission in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, my name is Michael Sowers. I'm the Technology Innovation Librarian here at the Commission. Uh, this is uh, our monthly Tech Talk show. Uh, usually Krista Burns, our regular host, is here with me, but at the moment she is flying back from some training in Minnesota, and I'm assuming she's on a plane at the moment, so uh, I haven't heard otherwise. Haven't heard that she's stuck in an airport, so hopefully all those uh, the craziness that was going on with flights uh, is not affecting her all that much. Um, today's episode is uh, to talk about the recent uh, Internet Librarian Conference that was held in Monterey, California, just a week or so ago. And um, in the past, we've done a show kind of live from the conference, but it, uh, technology didn't quite work out this time, so we're kind of doing a post-conference wrap-up the next week. Um, I, because of the weather on the East Coast and, and the holiday and various other things, uh, not uh, everybody I uh, asked was able to uh, make it onto the show that was, was at the conference, but we do have a, a small but excellent panel of people who both presented and attended uh, the uh, conference last week, and so I'm going to have some questions for them. We'll get some discussion going. Um, and uh, talk about how the conference was. So uh, on the phone, uh, or on the line, and I'll have each of them introduce themselves in a moment, but we do have uh, Brian and Dave from uh, the Mo Mo Mokina Public Library. Am I saying that right? That's correct. Oh, good. Okay. I keep trying to pronounce it the other way. Uh, we have uh, Nicole from Bywater Solutions. Nicole, you're on the line? Yes, I am. Hello. Okay, good. Oh, don't make me nervous like that. Um, <laughs> and Cicely Walker from Vancouver Public Library. Cicely, you're on the line. It's Cecily, but hi. Cecily, I'm, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, and, and which Vancouver is that? Let's get this straight. The other Vancouver? I don't want to offend anybody and say the real Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the Canada... F that or the Canada, that, the, Canada the, Vancouver. the Vancouver further north than you're thinking. So, <laughs> all right. So, uh, welcome everybody, and welcome to those of you attending and, and listening live. Uh, just as a reminder, if you have any questions during this, there is a questions area in the GoToWebinar interface. Feel free to type in a question there, and I will pass those along to our panelists. Also, we do uh, take audio questions. Uh, if you'd like your microphone turned on, just Click the raise your hand button in the GoToWebinar interface, and I will happily uh, take your question that way also. So um, uh, all the folks that we have on the line today did actually uh, present at conference. So uh, I think we have more than enough time to do this. What I'd like to do is just give each of them kind of a, a five minutes or so to talk about what they presented on, give kind of another chance to, to, to get the word out about what they want to talk about. So um, guys, we're going to go ladies first, and uh, I'm going to start uh, just kind of at the bottom of my list and work up here. Nicole, why don't you go ahead and uh, kind of introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about what you do, and then what did you talk about at conference? All right. Well, hello, everybody. I'm one of those people on the East Coast, so I'm sort of uh, displaced right now, Just talking from a family's home instead of my own house, which has no power. Um, so, oh, no. Uh, yeah, well, that was why I, was, that's why I had the mic muted. Sorry, Michael, didn't mean to scare you. Um, I did, there's background noise here. So anyway, um, my job is uh, Vice President of Education at Bywater Solutions, which is a fancy way of saying I do all the training. Um, I, I do other stuff too, but the you know, primary role is training on the Koha Open Source ILS. And um, because of that, I, of course, have to learn a whole lot about open source software. And so the... Um, first talk I gave at the conference was on open source issues and trends, and that was a, a presentation with Marshall Breeding where we sort of went back and forth, and Marshall has, if you've gone to his site before, librarytechnology.org, it has so many uh, numbers, <laughs> statistics, resources. He has all this info. So he covered you know, the numbers and you know, what we're seeing as far as trends on that respect. And um, I covered a lot of what I see by going into all these libraries and talking to these librarians. So um, what I ma mainly you know, talked about as far as um, issues, the number one issue and all the issues after that came back to it was the fact that um, there's just not enough education about what open source software is. 
And so a lot of people have misconceptions, fears, concerns, and that just uh, you know keeps piling on top of it. And if people were educated better, then all the issues that I see um, from the you know personal side of things would go away because people would understand better. And I'm sure you all see that yourselves. When you don't understand something, it's kind of scary, and you don't really want to uh, take part in it. <laughs> so. Um, you know, I listed a few issues, every single one of them coming back to education. Uh, we, we were having so much fun going back and forth and talking with the audience and stuff that I didn't get to go through all the trends, but the slides are there. Uh, there's a link uh, from the page, I think, that Mar uh, Michael has up there, and if not, they're on my website, which is also linked from this page here, right there in the center there. There's web2learning.net. Um, but the trends that I wanted to point out was that, you know, we, uh, we in libraries, sort of, uh, you know, have a single view of just our, our, our little world and we don't look out into what other industries are doing, which is some of the cool stuff I got to see at Internet Library and that I liked, that I will talk about later, but um, yeah, uh, in the rest of the world, people are really pushing open source software for a lot of reasons. Uh, it used to be cost, but now the main reason really is reliability, and that's pretty awesome. So governments, entire governments, are pushing for open source software or switching uh, the Italian government, the French government, the German government, and uh, the U.S. government has a... Uh, uh, open Source for America or something like that, I forget the exact URL, but a, a whole push for more open source software. And then my other talk was uh, a panel, a Tuesday evening session talking about librarians in roles that are uh, non-traditional and kind of where I am. So I'm, I'm working for a company, not a library, but I do work with libraries. And we talked about our path and how we got there, and it was really fun. It was it was really nice to get to talk to all the people in the audience and, and meet all the people on the panel. And um, I won't go through my whole you know trail uh, through uh, you know to get to where I am today. But the main goal, you know, the main thing we talked about was uh, you know you've got to be interested in trying things, you've got to be uh, courageous, and you've got to you know just push through and try and, and get where you want to go, and and not assume that all roles in libraries include sitting at the reference desk or the circulation desk or the, the cataloging desk. There are lots of other things we can do, too. So. Great. Thanks. Yeah. I appreciate it. Uh, Cecily, uh, how about you? And, in fact, I believe you were also on that uh, panel in the evening, correct? Oh, no. Do we lose Cecily again? Okay, well, while we work uh, on Cecily's audio, uh, Brian and Dave, how about we go to you and uh, you kind of introduce yourselves. I know you've been on the show before, and uh, let us know what you guys were talking about at conference. All right, um, I'm Brian. I'm the uh, Director of IT at the Mokina Library. And I'm Dave. I'm the uh, Director of Building Operations at the Mokina Library. And uh, I was on two different panels, or three different, yeah, one workshop and two different panels. Um, Two of the, one of the workshops and panels talked about engaging team library users and using different methods to get them to engage in your library. Um, we focused a lot on text, uh, so we, we talked about the Siftio cubes, and Dave will talk about that later. Um, but we talked about how we brought in a lot of toys and gadgets for the teams to get involved. One of the key pieces, though, was a Sphero ball that we used to get the teams to come talk to us. Uh, so we would drive around this little ball at a high school, and uh, the teams will then uh, approach us versus us approaching the team. So it, it kind of helps communicate differently. Um, a few of the key takeaways that I think from, from our from, from those two sessions, uh, the workshop and the panel, um, is that you have to engage your teams in order to get them to come to the library. And you have to come out with really cool different ways. It doesn't have to be focused on reading. It, it should be about other things like Legos. Um, Susan Considine from the New York uh, Fayetteville Library did a really cool uh, Lego program where there are they are the first uh, Lego education like certified coaches on staff, and they're actually they uh, they have a team that they use with their patrons, and they're they're going to competitions now and building Legos. And I thought that was the coolest thing ever, and and uh, anyone can do it. Um, and we also we also did uh, the game night. So if you guys were there, uh, we got to play laser tag. And which was really cool. You got to see um, everyone, you know, running around shooting each other. 
Uh, but one of the great things about the laser tag program is, you know, we take it to various libraries and uh, you can actually tie it into books. Uh, for example, you know, Hunger Games is really popular right now. Uh, so we ran one right before we left for the conference where they basically did a Hunger Games laser tag. So the last person standing was the victor. Um, we had Siftio cubes, which uh, are little interactive um, cubes that interact with each other that do anything from um, math problems to spelling to um, word sorting to mazes. Uh, just really fun, interactive kind of a game. Uh, Brian mentioned a little bit about the Legos, um, which is great, especially for kids. Uh, they get to kind of start learning a little bit about basic programming with drag and drop that the Legos have. Uh, we can allow our homeschool population to check them out as well. Um, Sphero balls uh, are great. You can use them for some, you can use them to send people to stacks to show them where, you know, books are. You can take them to schools to engage the kids. And then we had the, um, we had uh, Connect uh, SDK kit for uh, a drawing program where it was all, uh, you know, you just kind of drew in the air and your picture appeared on the uh, poster. Um, and then the, uh, we also were both on a panel for the next big thing, and uh, that was a pretty cool panel. Michael Sowers was, was uh, moderating it, and uh, we talked about our interactive bookends, our, our tablets that you can have on the spines and check out books from, do book reviews. We've actually, after talking about it, we met somebody else, uh, Aaron Stanton from Booklamp, who is building a library game, uh, which is pretty cool. So we want to incorporate that in our tablets as well. So what a brief of what a library game was is basically every book has a uh, like a like a markup to it. Um, for instance, if it's a book about vampires, uh, if it's a book about vampires, then it's it's twenty five percent about vampires. So there's twenty five points you can get for reading that book for your character. So as you read more books about vampires or crime crime scene investigations, you get points and you level up, and it's it's kind of a neat way to read and and diversify yourself. Um, so we want to incorporate that, and then. Uh, Ben Bizzle talked about uh, his Facebook marketing, which was pretty cool. Um, so we, we were actually really encouraged to kind of do some more Facebook advertisements from it. And uh, Sarah Hopkins talked about uh, cutting things, cutting stuff that's not working, and that was, you know, that was people need to do that, and a lot of libraries were kind of nervous about it. So I'm glad that somebody mentioned it. Yeah, I think yeah. that's it for us. Yep, that's. And then, yeah, we had a great time, and then we'll also yeah. be doing the gaming night, though, uh, in, DC. in D.C. So if you didn't get a chance to play laser tag, you can in D.C. And the, the, uh, the game for books is also live on Kickstarter, so if you want to help fund the project. Yeah, D.C., it's, it's a lot easier for me to get there earlier on a Sunday, so I, 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 will, I will be making every attempt to actually, um, I've got to admit, given my age, given the fact that I you know, grew you up in the there. 80s, I have never actually played laser tag. So um, I'd like to. What? Oh, man. Yeah, I know. I, it's just I, I've never had the opportunity. But anyways, and and um, I'll mention you guys uh, mentioned the game of books uh, with with uh, uh, from Booklamp. Uh, he was our guest on I believe last month's Tech Talk, and he and he talked about that. And uh, I can say, you know, Chris and I here at the commission are kind of excited and, and wanting to play that. So we're, we're hoping that that mm -hmm. will get funded and, and actually happen. So uh, thank you, guys. Um, Cecily, let's try this again. I have unmuted you. Can you hear us, and can we hear you? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, perfect. All right, so uh, why don't you uh, introduce yourself uh, for us, let us know what you do, and then what, what is it you talked about at conference? Um, I'm Cecily Walker. I'm the Web Services and User Experience Librarian at Vancouver Public Library. The user experience part of that is not actually a, an official part of my title, but that's where I came from, and I'm really proud of that background, so I try to work it in there whenever I can. Um, I, Internet Librarian, I t was on the panel with Nicole talking about transforming roles, and it was really a great experience for me to be on that panel for a number of reasons, but one of the biggest reasons is that when I went to library school um, and when I graduated from library school, I knew that I didn't want to work in a library, and yet here I am. Um, for the first four years out of library school, I worked in corporations of various sizes. And even though um, I you know, was working either as a user experience person or a usability person, I always made it a point of letting the people that I know that I worked with that I was a librarian because I was very, very proud of that. And I also wanted to challenge people's perceptions of what a librarian was capable of and what 
the kinds of things that librarians knew. Most people that I worked with in various software companies have always had the perception, like a lot of people, that libraries are just about books, and you really only go to the library when you've got little kids and you want to get you know, an endless supply of children's books. So whenever it came up or whenever I had the opportunity to mention that I was a librarian or even on my business card, I had MLIS after my name, um, it, was, it was really part of my agenda to just sort of challenge people's perceptions of what a librarian really was. So even though I did that in my professional life, um, when I was talking to other librarians, though, and this is about, you know, eight years ago or so, anywhere between six to eight years ago, when I was talking to other librarians, there wasn't so much of a push for, in, for user experience as there is now. I often felt like that I wasn't a real librarian because I was doing very non-traditional work. Even when I came into libraries almost five years ago now, um, you know, I didn't have the, the experience of you know, balancing a budget or ordering materials. Um, I did information services work at the information desk, but you know, the, the things like with cataloging or technical services or doing children's library and you know, doing story times, those kinds of things, I didn't have those kinds of experiences. And even in my own organization, which is a very progressive place and a very welcoming place, I still sort of felt like I wasn't a real, quote unquote, in scare quotes librarian. Um, so it was really a, a good experience for me to be on that panel to, to meet other librarians or, or librarian information professionals who had come from a very non-traditional background or who had come from a more traditional background and ended up doing more non-traditional things. Um, I think having us all there in that one, in that one room, in that one space, was good for the, the, the conference as a whole um, because we still have people coming out of library school who think that you know um, because they are in library school the only kinds of things that they're qualified for the, the training that, that they receive is really only useful in the library um, in the library building. Someone mentioned to me uh, a few weeks ago that librarians are the only professionals where our job title is named after a building. You know, you don't call doctors hospitalarians. So I think sometimes because we are so, our, our title and what we do is so attached to a building, we sometimes have a really hard time of, of being able to get out of that building and seeing the skills and talents that we have are applicable in a lot of other settings. So um, I talked a little bit about that. I talked a little bit about how a librarian saved my life. Um, and I talked about being, um, <laughs> which kind of went over like a, a lead balloon on Twitter. I talked about one of the, the thing that I recommended for people to, to do was to be proud that they're a sparkle pony and be proud that they are, you know, that they are um, a unique individual and that they bring unique skills to the table. Be proud of that, but also understand that even though you are a unique individual and maybe that there is no one else quite like you in your organization, understand that fundamentally you're there to support the business, you're there to support the organization, and you're there to support your colleagues who maybe don't have the same skills. So you want to bring them along with you, even though you may be you know, the, the, the unique person there who, who doesn't have the same skills as everyone else. Yeah, I, I like what you said about, you know, we, we the hospitalarians. I hadn't I hadn't heard it put that way before. I've always, you know, made the comment about, you know, our, our organizations are named after the building. The American right. Library Association, not the American Librarians Association. So I think you've exactly. just taken taken that one step further for me. <laughs> so all right. Um, so yeah, I attended that 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 panel, and um, it was funny. It, it was kind of after the speaker's reception, and and the evening uh, session tends to be a, a um, funnier session, kind of a little really loose. And and there was there were people talking, going, "Well, I don't know. It sounds pretty serious. It's not going to be funny. I don't know." And I'm actually really glad I attended. I thought it was a, a, a wonderful conversation. Uh, we got into roles. We got into um, uh, mentoring uh, of, of you know, newer librarians. We've, I almost said younger, and that's not necessarily true. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, what it means to be a librarian in librarian school. And it's one of those discussions that will probably never end, but I think is, is definitely one that, that needs to be ongoing and needs to be had. Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and turn everybody's mics back on here. And so here's my next question, and I'll let whoever wants to respond to this one first uh, go ahead. Um, you've talked about the sessions you presented at. What, what I want to hear about is what, what sessions did you attend that weren't yours um, that you thought were, were well worth your time or there was something out of there that you, you think everybody should have, should have been there to hear? I, um, this is Nicole, and I mentioned you know, when I was talking about 
my, my talk on, on open source and trends outside of libraries, um, that I, there were talks I had attended that were also about trends outside of libraries that I really liked. And the one I attended was about um, the retail industry and overlap between what they're doing and you know what we can do and some really cool technologies they're using in the retail industry. Um, and I, I really, I, it was really, really interesting. Um, I don't know how much I'd like to take advantage of some of the things they're doing, like virtual dressing rooms. Um, but you know, they were talking a lot about how they're using technologies and, in libraries and I'm sorry, in in retail, and some of the ways we can bring that into the library setting. And they were giving examples of of um, augmented reality was was kind of a, a cool thing they were showing. Like in retail, they were doing things where you you could hold up a tag basically in front of a mirror and it would show you the outfit in multiple different colors or would even show you the outfit on you. Um, and th th that's why I'm saying, you know, kind of cool. And there were ways that people were using augmented li uh, reality in the libraries as well to, to show more information and things like that. And I, I don't know, it was, it was really cool. And, and I, I wrote it up, uh, I did put it on my site, and I put a lot of um, links that I got from them, things I had never heard of uh, going on in stores and stuff. I guess I'm not going to the right stores, but um, <laughs> things like that. I thought that was a really, really interesting talk. Um, yeah, I, you, 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 I, I, I kind of held up a book in front of my face there. I don't know if you, you, you saw that. I was thinking, you know, what would I look like holding this book? <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> You could do that. But, I mean, more accurately, um, I think, you know, things like I could hold a book up to the mirror and it would maybe pop up, you know, a similar title uh, without you having to, to search a catalog or something like that. Maybe you could do uh, that sort of thing. Um, Does this... there's, uh, there, was, there were some libraries that were, I know that the most popular tweet from the conference was that, you know, QR codes are dead, but um, there was this library um, that doesn't have, they don't have a physical building. And so what they've done is they've actually put QR codes up around town that you can scan to get e-books. Yep. So you scan them and the e-book gets downloaded to your device. Um, and that was kind of cool. Yeah, does this, butt, does this book make my butt look big? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. And, and, and mm -hmm. I... I mean, we can get onto the whether or not QR codes are are dead or not, and I I kind of shake my head at that. I think they they can be used appropriately, but I know there are a bunch of people who who don't agree with that. But let, let's not go there. Um, Cecily, how about you? What 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 did you attend that you thought was interesting? Um, probably the most useful session for me was uh, Amanda Etches's session on sensible library website development, and even though it, it felt for me a bit like an echo chamber. Sometimes it's nice to have those things reinforced. Um, the, she used the metaphor of the library website being a junk drawer, which when I said it, I it, had I you know been alone and, and, and not around in a room full of people, I probably would have jumped up and down and said, yes, because that's how I'm feeling uh, about our library website. Um, ironically enough, she, she put up the Vancouver Public Library's website up as an example of, of a library that's doing it right. So it just shows you that perspective is everything when you're talking about, you know, when you're thinking about library website development. But, you know, one of the things that she has been really pushing for um, is the, the concept of Making sure that your content is is it, it meets your business goals, but at the same time, really making sure that the content that you're promoting on your website is really just there to help people get a job done and help people be successful. Using fewer words, um, making sure that you know the content that you're writing is clear and concise, um, engaging as well, and doing things that for for me um, that really seem you know heretical, like using bold text periodically throughout a paragraph to highlight um, pertinent ideas, which when I saw it, I really resisted, but now that I think about it, I think it's a really great idea and it's something that I'd like to try to implement. But, you know, like I said, even though it was reinforcing a lot of ideas that I, I knew before, it was still really useful um, and to, to be in that room and, and see the light bulbs go on over other people's heads um, and, and seeing where people becoming more interested in the concept of user experience, not only as it applies to just your website, Site, but the whole library user experience from the time that somebody enters the library, whether that's through the physical building or your website, to the time that they are, you know, checking out books. So that's been really, really exciting for me, and, and that was the, the session that I liked the most. 
Yeah, one one thing I heard while I was there, which which I've already had a a, a chance to to use elsewhere, and and I've been kind of thinking about maybe the one thing that 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 was the most thought provoking that I heard. So I'm still processing it. Was um, it was Ben Bizzle who said when talking about their website and their advertising that um, they're trying not to um, follow trends but to build platforms. Yes, exactly. Use. And um, I've already repeated that to to at least several other people, and and something that I think um, uh, we'll come back to this. I think uh, so. I'll give everybody kind of time to think about it. But you know, what was kind of the most thought provoking thing uh, for you out of the conference? And and that was mine. But we'll we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, so Brian and Dave, how about you guys? What what did you attend that that um, stuck? I. I I kind of two, two of them that I really liked. Uh, the first one was uh, the web, the developing a web presence, as well, and that was really like, yeah, I understand how to build a website and everything, but I didn't see it as as it, I saw it in a different perspective, which was helpful. Um, for instance, uh, somebody made a comment too during, you know, let the patrons define the space, art collection, furniture, et cetera, your website. Um, so the the presenter was also like, you know, you got to go out into the community and ask patrons when they go to the website, what are they looking for versus building a website and chalking it full of everything, just find out what just they need. And I thought that was, you know, that would that would save a lot of space, less clutter everywhere. Um, so yeah, I really, I really liked that session a lot. It really I took a ton of notes. Um, and then another, uh, David Lee King mentioned uh, Spark, which is a free enterprise open source chatting tool. And then you can embed it with your website. I have to try it out still, but it, it looks pretty cool. Um, so you can have people on your website chatting with your staff members when they're in the building all, all through your website. Uh, let's see if I have a, a link for you. Uh, Spark IM client, maybe? I see yeah, it down. Oh, here we go. <clears throat> yep. Oh, for internal, so, yes. You know, it does internal and external, though. Oh, okay. So you can chat amongst your internal network and then also from your website. Cool. Um, so I, I got to do more homework on it. And I'll, I'll, when I find the link, I'll shoot it over to you. Okay. Uh, yeah, great. And then um, the other, yep. Go ahead. And then the other session, um, what was it? It was, it was making, uh, making, laughing at your library and trying to be more, you know, comical and stuff. And, and walk the line of, uh, you know, don't cross the line, but walk the line and, you know, try to get people to interact and, and laugh and think that, you know, you have a sense of humor. So one of the pictures that I remember that were, they were talking about it was uh, I like big books and I cannot lie as, as a uh, on a bulletin board and I thought that was I'm like you know that's that's clever and you know it's not it's not bad or anything and yeah that's the website yep and so so yeah and so I kind of want to try to do some I'm not very good at making jokes I usually cross the line when I make a joke so I gotta I gotta do some homework on that but I thought it was a really interesting way and then uh, the the other library that does those uh, those you know those e card things but they make them into jokes with like the old 60s, 70s characters and they have a funny little little quote. Um, and I remember other ones that I've seen in the past too, like uh, on a billboard on a, uh, on a highway, it's a double, double, spoiler alert, Dumbledore dies on page 467 <laughs> or whatever the page number is. Um, yeah. And so I thought that was, that, you know, that's, that's clever and cute and so it makes me kind of want to go check out the library. So those are like the two big things, trying to engage your community more uh, versus going to your community. Dave, did you have anything? Oh, uh, he actually, he actually oh, had to leave. Okay. <laughs> yep. All right. Um, okay, so I'm going to mention two that that I uh, attended, and I don't uh, particularly remember the, the the titles of the session. Uh, one is the website that I just brought up uh, here, which is from the Escondido uh, Public Library. They're doing a series of videos called Library U, and the idea is that they're actually having they're working with patrons to create videos that are oral history or how to do something. Um, so here's one, you know, research your historic uh, Escondido home and uh, grief management through artistic expression, a uh, D-Day survivor, a Holocaust survivor. And I thought these were really, really interesting ways to kind of get your um, <clears throat> public involved with the library, the library involved with the public. Uh, whether they be uh, uh, businesses or um, uh, uh, just local uh, uh, residents, and um, 
then, you know, from the video production standpoint and things like that that I thought were, was really, really interesting. And uh, Amy from uh, Omaha Public is commenting that she, she loved this session, too. And Amy, if you want, if you want in on the conversation, just, just say so, and I will, I will happily turn on your microphone. Um, the other one that I will mention is... I had a question um, about that. Oh, yeah, go ahead. So, did the, so the staff took the videos or did the patrons take videos of other patrons? No, the, in, in, as I understand it so far, the staff has been doing the actual filming. Um, okay. With that, and they, they, in some cases, they've literally gone out to a farmer's field to, to do the video, that sort of thing. So they've got some pretty good equipment and, and some uh, pretty good uh, editing skills there. But I guess they've even got patrons saying, I want to do one. So I, I think that would be wonderful. Uh, you know, maybe they'll eventually be able to kind of turn it over to, to the public at large. Uh, not uh, completely sure on that. Um, but... Um, uh, so, yeah, I, this is one I'm going to keep an eye on. The other one I'll bring up here real quick, and the, the funny story on this one is if you look at the address here, this is unl.edu. This is actually going on about three blocks from where I'm sitting right now uh, at the Love Library at UNL. Uh, Pixel is their um, <coughs> reference chat bot, basically, uh, artificial intelligence. And when I, when I went in to sit in on this uh, session, I didn't even realize who was presenting. I just looked at the title and thought, artificial intelligence with the, in the library, that sounds cool. And then I realized it was folks that work three blocks from me. Um, they'll actually be on our Tech Talk for November if you're uh, interested more in, in this particular uh, topic. I think what, what's going on there is pretty darn cool. So, I had a little conversation with Pixel actually during that talk. Um, I was you know, trying to learn about open source software, obviously, um, while uh, while she was presenting, and and Pixel and I had a little bit of an altercation because she she just kept got getting stuck on the word software, and she wasn't paying attention to the words open source. And so we went back and forth, and they they gave her some personality, which was kind of cool. Then they talked about that in the talk. And so at one point I just I typed hmm h m m m m and she replied well statistically people usually type hmm with two m's. Okay, I said I said I, said, I actually replied like that will, that was more helpful than your search for software. So um, <laughs> um, wow. but yeah, I mean it, they were saying they were programming her, you know, and she's and she's learning and you know all that stuff. So it's a really cool project. I'm I'm not bashing it at all, but it's kind of cool. You know, go in and try try talking to her because they're actually reading the logs so that they can mm -hmm. learn how to make her better. So um, that was kind of my goal there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there's one other I bet I'll mention, and I, I'm sure they will talk about this uh, when, when they're on the show, but if, if you start becoming rude to her, at a certain point she will refuse to talk with you anymore until you apologize. And most people generally end up apologizing, <laughs> which is I find very interesting from a psychological standpoint. Um, Okay, so did anybody on the line attend any of the ebook sessions? I did. Okay. Um, could you tell? Uh, ultimately, I have, a, I have a little story I'll share about this. But what 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 was being talked about ebooks this time around? Can can you? Well, share? I only went to one of them, and, and this is the first day at my first day um, at Interlibrary, and this is Monday, and Monday was kind of a weird day because I felt like I spent most of Monday picking the wrong sessions. Uh, the session that I was in, in the ebook session, the person who was speaking was a, a law librarian, um, you know, and, and serving a completely different clientele than, you know, I'm used to as, as a public librarian, and, and our biggest issue, or one of our biggest issues as public librarians is that we just can't make the content available when people really want it, um, to the degree that people want. You know, we only have one or two copies of a title, and, you know, this, the, the law librarian who was talking was talking about the different challenges of whether or not to present content to people, giving people the option of having either an e-book or the physical book or both. Um, and, and while that was really interesting, it, just, it, it, it wasn't applicable to anything that I have to deal with on a, on a daily basis. So, and, and I didn't, I wasn't sure if the rest of the ebook stream was going to be like that, um, but it kind of just made me, it put me off a little bit because it was just, it's, it wasn't something that I could use in my real life. Sure. Okay. Yep. Fair enough. I mean, that, that happens to all of us. I, 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 um, I, Jennifer Corber from the Boston Public Library and I were running a track all day Monday, so I was able to uh, unable to attend anything but my track. Um, so I always like to hear the the 
the the story that brings me to to the asking about the ebooks track was that during one of our sessions uh, in in our track, which worked out kind of as an unconferency sort of model where we had nine tables, we had people suggest nine topics and then go to your table and talk about that topic for the majority of the session and then we'll have all the tables report back. Well, one of the nine tables picked the topic ebooks. And then we said, okay, and we got all nine topics set up and we, we put a chart up on the wall and we said, okay, now everybody go to the table for the topic that you're interested in talking about. Hmm. And nobody sat at the ebooks table. Wow. It was empty. <laughs> and we we just we we kind of just stood back and we're we're trying to figure out what just happened. And so we asked people at the end we said, you know, how many people in the room think that ebooks is an important topic right now in libraries? And pretty much the whole room raised their hand. And then we said, well, why did nobody sit at the table? <laughs> And the general response we got, and maybe I'll ask each of you if you you have any comments of this, is is we're just so darn tired of talking about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. What? Yeah, I'd, what, I'd have to agree with that. So what? What do we? I, I, you know, here let's solve the ebook problem right here and now on this call. <laughs> um, what? Other? Okay. I don't know what to say beyond that. Does anybody have, I'm not even sure what the question is at this point. We're well, all I think, tired of talking about it, but it's really important. One thing with ebooks, it, it's like beating a dead horse. So everyone knows there's a problem with the ebook market, and now everyone's doing their own specific ebook solution. And I personally think that we all need to band together and come up with a single solution versus 20 different people working on 20 different of their own projects. Like there's one live, there's two or three libraries that have made their own ebook publishing platform. Then there's a couple other libraries that are doing their own ebook lending platform. And it's it's through redundancy and you're gonna have errors and we, we all need to just, you know, stop complaining and come up with a solution that we can just use. But that's that's my whole take on it at least. So you're willing to spearhead that? Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in in my world, I don't. Um, I mean, I hear about the ebooks situation. Um, I you know, I certainly purchase my own ebooks personally, but we don't really deal a whole lot, you know, with the whole uh, ebook thing at the library or licensing. All I hear, are, you know, the grumbles from everybody else. So I didn't really feel I had anything. Con I was in that room, by the way. I didn't really feel I had anything to contribute to such a discussion, since I really don't know from the the you know on the ground forefront. Uh, how it's working. Mm -hmm. Everything I've learned, I've learned at conferences and, and through mailing lists and all that stuff. And um, I kind of a agree. Uh, I think that you know, maybe we all got to come together and, and see if we can find a way to handle it on our own. And, and isn't there, I'm totally drawing a blank on the name, isn't there a group out there that's trying to do that for us? There is. Yeah, uh, Library Renewal. Yep. Thank yeah, you. Michael Porter's group. Yeah. I kept, I, I kept thinking, you know, what well, library root or something, and I'm like, hey, that's not right. So, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I think maybe what we need to do is, you know, you know, I don't think any of us needs to spearhead it, but maybe we need to, to jump on board and, and see how we can help there. Yes, I, I agree with that. Cecily, how about you? Um, I mean, it's, I love the idea of, of, of us all banding together and trying to come up with one solution, but, you know, being that I'm in Canada, and Canada is, you know, an, it's Canada. Um, it's 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 difficult to try to find something that would work both in the in the United States and Canada because I mean what seems to happen here is that if we find a solution that works really really well um, in the United States and we try to import that solution to Canada, the very first roadblock we hit we hit is that we hear from patrons, well, there's not enough Canadian content in here, and so then we end up going back to publishers and saying, well, you have to put more Canadian content in, and you know because a lot of well, I'm going to say something that's probably going to get me in trouble, so hopefully my director won't hear this, but because a lot of a lot of publishers will think of ebooks in terms of like a physical thing and or a bookshelf, they'll think, well, if we add more 
more Canadian content, that means you've got to take some other content away. Not to mention that, you know, not you know, forgetting that we're dealing with like pixels and ones and zeros that really don't take up a whole lot of space. So it would, it's a really nice idea, but for somebody who lives outside the, the United States, I don't know how realistic it is. I know that I am not really tired of hearing about ebooks. I'm really tired of the inflexibility and the resistance and the pushback that we're getting uh, because we know that here in Vancouver where our ebook adoption very similar to in North America it's people who have money who have means who have choices it's not the people who are you know hard scrabble who are trying to use ebooks so we're we're pushing this content down to people who have choices and have means and their experiences are shaped by you know, commercial things, commercial properties like Amazon, like iTunes, like Kobo here in Canada, mm -hmm. where you can buy things at the click of a button and we are not making it that easy. And people just, our patrons just don't understand, well, why can't you make it that easy? And we can try to talk about DRM until the cows come home, but they don't get it and they don't care. And until we can... Uh, get over that hurdle, it's always going to be something that isn't compelling enough for patrons to want to use it. You know, they don't understand why we can only have one copy of an ebook when they can just go to Amazon and buy it and never have to wait on it. So until we can solve that problem of delivery, um, on, you know, on-demand delivery without a waiting list, I don't know that we're going to see really huge adoption rates, the kinds of adoption rates, adoption rates that make the headaches worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, you know, I'm in a state library. We generally don't deal directly with patrons, but the majority of libraries in the state of Nebraska get overdrive through us. So every once in a while, we do talk directly to a patron. And I had one just a couple of weeks ago. She had an Android tablet. She was using overdrive, but and she was using the overdrive app, but she was literally like, well, I can open PDFs from other places, why can't I open the PDFs from OverDrive? Right. I can right. open, I can get Kindle books from Kindle on my tablet. Why can't I get the Kindle book through OverDrive? And you know, if 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 your software is offering this to me, why can't I open it? And and I'm trying to have a DRM conversation with a patron who just wants it to work. Mm -hmm. Was yeah, it was, reminds? It, I'm Rocky. sorry. It reminds. Go it ahead. reminds me of an experience I had when I was when I first started off um, in user experience. One of the first observations I had was going to a bank and watching people on the front lines of a bank trying to use the new software that the bank had developed. And it was a, a process that used to take only about 10 minutes to open up a new account with the new software was taking upwards of 45 minutes. And I sat there watching this poor woman and a really frustrated customer. And the customer actually said to her, do you know what you're doing? which is a chilling moment. And I find that our library staff are having the exact same moment every time we have a patron come to us to say, you know, you know, how can I do this? How can I download this? Why can't I put this on my tablet? And we have to go, well, you know, we're having that exact same moment. And as long as we have people coming to us and with the experience of you don't know what you're doing, it's not ever going to be the number one choice or it's not ever going to be a positive experience. And people are going to be looking at us in a negative light. So. You know, that's my big worry, that people are just looking at library staff as, as, that, like, we're incompetent. Not that we're not trying, but that we don't know what we're doing because we're so hemmed in by these restrictions. So let, let me ask one other ebooks question because I, 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 I love this conversation, but well, then, then we'll move on. Um, I, 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 I won't name names because that this person is not here to speak up for herself, but there's at least one library I know of here in the States that has basically said, Overdrive, we're done. I am not spending any more money on ebooks because of all these issues that we're talking about, um, despite the fact that her patrons do want them. Is, is that something we should be doing? Should, should, should libraries be drawing a line in the sand, or do we need to like, work with the system, or does anybody have any kind of reactions to, to that position? I think that if, I mean, if you could get a critical mass, of course that kind of thing would actually, would actually serve a purpose. It's just like, you know, if you get enough people boycotting, you know, the product, I would assume that in order for them to stay in business, they would have to make some changes and work more with us. However, like you said, I mean, that sort of, it does, it affects the patrons who want the product, and how do you get that critical mass? And how do you get that critical mass all at once? I mean, you've got mm -hmm. contracts and 
people who are stuck in contracts. And I, I don't know. I don't think uh, I don't think it's going to work. I would love to see it work. I love the idea, but sure. yeah, I agree. All right. Okay, so um, let's let's circle back around to to the the, the thought provoking idea, or what what is it has got you really kind of going hmm uh, out of this conference? Mine was the you know uh, a, as I said, um, not following trends, but but building platforms. Um, is there kind of one or two things that each of you kind of came away from the conference and said, you know what, I I really need to think about that more, and and I'm not even necessarily want you to say, here's what you've now come up with, but just what, what is on your mind because of, of your experience at the conference? And I'll let whoever speaks up go go ahead, go first. All right. Um, well, one of the biggest things that I heard said a couple of times, and I repeated it now, and it's kind of a, it kind of was an eye-opener. Um, so, you know, when, when people say, like, oh, those kids in the library are loud, or those teens are loud, uh, that's very derogative, because technically, if you replace the word teen or kid with any ethnic group, you're going to have a lawsuit. And I was like, oh, you know what, yeah. And I know there's tons of, tons, I, know, I, I, don't, I shouldn't say tons, but I hear it every now and then in different libraries. I'll be in the library, someone will be like, oh, those teens are being noisy over there again. And, and it's like, you know, and you, you kind of just ignore it because, you know, teens are noisy. But you know, if you replace that word teen with another ethnic group, you're, you're, now you're, you know, you're being very disrespectful. And so it was kind of like an eye opener for me because I probably might have said it once or twice as well. And so now I'm like always, always trying to be cognizant and seeing if I hear it and whatnot. And I thought it was kind of, kind of a very unique perspective. Uh, Patrick Sweeney is the one that that mentioned it. I think um, for me, mine actually came from from Twitter uh, during that evening session. A lot of people were you know tweeting uh, questions and comments and repeating things we were saying and. And uh, one of the things uh, Cecily had said was that we could that we we could all be special. And uh, someone commented on Twitter and said, "Well, then how do you if everybody's special, who's going to do the day-to-day -day work?" And I, I I was kind of I mean at first a little bit put off because um, I'm special. So was and I. I tons of, <laughs> yeah, right. And see, and I and I do tons of day-to-day -day work. I mean, I'm you know I. I sit there and I answer support tickets all the time. I answer the phone. I, you know, I write up press releases. I mean, these are not special fun things. These, it's my job. And so I think it was kind of like um, people were, were taking special to being entitled. Um, yeah. and, and I'm sure there are people that are special and entitled. But that was certainly not what we were trying to say there. What, I, mean, I know it was not what Cecily was trying to say. And, and um, I kept fighting back with that on Twitter. Um, so that one sort of stuck with me. It was like, and you know, and I, I think it stuck with me too, just from personal experience. People often look at those of us who who do try to be special and be different as if we are entitled and don't realize that hey, we are doing a ton of other things that are not, you know, what you would categorize as you know, you know, I don't know, super special or anything. Um, so I don't know. I I was a little offended, put off by it, and but I mean I can understand where the person was coming from. So. Yeah, I'm trying to think of a way to, yeah, go go back on that and say, you know, well, yeah, spe special does not mean um, that you don't get, you don't have to do the boring stuff with everybody else too. <laughs> yeah, I I think that one was pretty interesting. I w I was in the audience and I was I was I was watching that happen. I I didn't get involved, but but, uh, but I watched it happen. <laughs> yes, I and, started something. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> hey, you know, really, if you get that going, that that's kudos to you. I think what happened, and and maybe this is. Uh, to kind of maybe defend the person who who started get started the snark going back back against what she said, I think basically somebody tweeted what Cecily said, and then somebody who wasn't in the room made that comment about then who's going to do the regular stuff. So maybe kind of missed um, some of the context. No, no, she was there. Oh, she I was there. Oh, yeah, and okay. we actually had a conversation about it. At, in, in the bar where karaoke was happening later oh, that night. Okay. And so we, we had an opportunity to work through that and, and after we had that conversation she really understood better where I was coming from. Oh good. And okay. she and her, her, her initial response was shaped by someone that she worked with 
who had that mm -hmm. sense of entitlement. And I just had to oh, let her know okay. that even though Special Snowflake has that sort of connotation, um, that's not how I meant it. I don't mean that you know, you, you're a prima donna. I mean that you do have special skills. You need to evangelize yourself. Be proud of those things. But at the same time, understand, you've got to do the grunt work as well. Right. Right. Okay. Cool. Um, and so, Cecily, how about you? What, what sort of big idea, thought-provoking thing came out of the conference for you? A really thought-provoking idea that came out of the uh, Next Big Thing conference was something that came through Twitter. And I wish I could have met the guy who, who mentioned this. He, he came up with the idea that he thought the next big thing for libraries was to be, uh, his name is Carson Block, and if anybody knows him, tell him this is a great idea, um, that libraries should be embracing our, our roles as uh, a hyper-local treasure, that we are providing local content that nobody else can provide. And the reason why that kind of blew my, well, what little hair I have, blew my hair back um, was because I have friends who are, uh, a friend who decided, she took an idea that she wanted to have a, a, a mobile app um, that only had the, the menu and the hours of the restaurant in her area. And that's all the app does. And the app has been a runaway success. She's not even thinking about going international or national. She wants to only focus on her community. And I started looking at other sort of, you know, apps that are only really focused on your local area. And, and, and starting thinking about, you know, the resources that we have, like at Vancouver Public Library, all the digital resources that we have, that if we partnered with somebody, we could just do some really amazing development that really only focused on the things that make Vancouver unique. And I don't know if any other libraries are doing that kind of work because we, we seem to be so focused globally and outward, but instead of looking at our own community. So the concept of us just focusing on being the hyper-local experts was really exciting to me. Yeah, and, and that immediately I brought back up here that library you from, you yeah. know, I mean, that's, that's the sort of thing they're trying to do. In this case, via video, but you know, and and Amy Mather from Omaha Public in our chat is is basically uh, screaming yes, yes, curating your community. Love that idea with with, yes, with lots of exclamation points, and and that's what she's trying to do on Pinterest uh, with with her library. So um, you know, trying to become that local resource. And I think there's tons of ways you can do that. All right. Well, we're we're getting close to our hour, and and I'm I'm now almost glad I didn't have like eight people on the line because this has been an amazing uh, conversation with with just the four of us. Um, so I guess just the the last thing I'll ask is is well, first of all, I'll remind everybody who's attending live that um, you can ask us a question in the Q and A area or or raise your hand, and I will happily turn on your microphone for you. And also all the links that we've been talking about, I we will, we will do our best on this end to collect all those and make them available with the recording when that goes up either later today or uh, tomorrow, end of the week at the outside. <clears throat> so I figure I just kind of go around um, uh, one more time. Um, and actually, I'm going to change my question a little bit. I want to ask each of you to answer the following question. Why should somebody go to this conference? And, and I'll give you kind of all a moment to think about that. And then, so if you've never been, you've got to pick a conference. Maybe you usually go to ALA, but maybe you're thinking, you know, why should they go to this one instead or at all? And whoever wants to take that one first, uh, well, well, I'll let you go ahead. All right. Um, the Interlibrarian, by far, is one of my favorite conferences. Um, it seems to be a lot more engaging, and people are a lot more, or people aren't very clickish at the Interlibrarian. They're all willing to, they'll hear an idea that you mentioned somewhere else, and they'll come and find you and ask you about it. And I thought that's always kind of neat. So, like, for example, as an interactive book an idea I had, uh, Aaron hunted me down. and was like, oh, hey, I'm going to this is what I'm trying to do. This is a really cool idea. I want to see if you want to help out. And I was like, that is you know, and that, that doesn't really happen, at least, at least to me at other conferences. So at the Internet Librarian, it's a lot of sharing of ideas and communication. I like that. I like collaboration. Okay. Um, I always, you know, even though I work in technology, um, I like the Internet Librarian Conference because I still learn new things. Um, there's still always something that I didn't know about that I, that I come away with. Um, and I don't I, I, sometimes conferences like ALA or, or SLA are, are just too big and there's too much going on and too hard to, to 
filter and figure out what's best and too much of a chance that you'll end up in a talk that you know just doesn't doesn't teach you anything. So I like Internet Library because, like I said, even though I, I keep up with the field, I can't keep up with everything. So I like being around the people who, who are in a similar field and are sharing all that info with me. Mm -hmm. I like Internet Library because it, it, it kind of reminds me of South by Southwest in a way, in that mm -hmm. you are in the room with the people who are making epic stuff and doing <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to clean it up. Um, and who are doing really, really interesting things at their libraries, but there are no hierarchies and there are no barriers. And you can actually go up to somebody and say, you know what, that was rad. Tell me more about it. And, and this is what we're doing. And is there any opportunity for collaboration? Or if there is no opportunity for collaboration, can I kind of take that idea and run with it where I am? Um, and it gives you an opportunity in a smaller conference to sort of break out of your comfort area, comfort area. Like even though I live in those sort of UX bubble, I was able to go to, you know, the ebook sessions. I was able to just sort of poke my nose in the door at the school, um, the school's track at Internet Library. And I really, really appreciate that because everything is in a much smaller physical space. So you're not having to like truck four blocks to go and, and check out, you know, what other people are doing. Yeah, worst case you have to go across the street. And, yeah. You know, that's for the, for the hardship. I know. <laughs> and then you can even do it in a covered walkway most of the way. Uh, uh. I, I, you know, I, guessing I should answer my own question. I'm not sure what else I can, I can add. I mean, all, all three of you pretty much said anything I can think of. But just playing off of, of one thing uh, Cecily said is I don't think I've ever actually heard the word no from somebody at that conference when I said, hey, can I use that idea? Hey, can you, you give me more detail? Hey, can I contact you? Hey, can we have you on the show? Um, you know, it's just, everybody's like, yeah, go ahead, please. That's what we're here for. We're here to share those ideas, um, and we're here to um, inspire other people and, and um, you know, let, let, let all the, the special, let all the snowflakes bloom. No, I'm not mixing my metaphors. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I... At this point, we're we're just about at our hour here. So, do any of you have just anything else you want to uh, throw out there? Pitch, um, just something you wanted to say about the conference or what you're currently working on that I haven't already given you a chance to do so. Nope. Silence. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> that works well. I you know I want to give everybody the chance. So um, I, I want to thank all three of you. This this was amazing. I, I you know I, I put, we, whenever we put together these shows, we 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 were like, well, we have a plan. Let's see how well it goes, and we usually pull it off very well. And sometimes it's just absolutely amazing. And I think this hour has gone way faster than I was expecting it to. So so thanks to to all of you uh, for doing this and and taking some time out of your day to to help us out with this. Um, Thank you for those of all of you who attended and those of you who have listened to the recording. Uh, they just want to tell you, uh, coming up next week on Encompass Live is Nancy Drew and Friends or the Case of the Neglected Books, the History and Importance of Youth Series Books. Uh, that sound, one sounds interesting. I think I will probably attend that. And then on uh, that will be on November 7th. On November 14th, uh, it's not a tech talk, but I'll be involved again. We're going to actually talk about creating video book talks from script to screen. We are going to actually uh, create one on video and edit it and publish it all live on the show. So you can see how easy it is, assuming nothing goes horribly wrong with the technology. So, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll, I, in fact, I've got a meeting this afternoon to figure out how we're going to do that. So uh, thanks once again to our, uh, our uh, panelists, and thank you once again to everybody who attended. Uh, this is Michael Sowers of the Nebraska Library Commission uh, saying thanks for attending Encompass Live this week, and we'll catch you again next week. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.